Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Christian year can be divided up into two big parts. In the first half, from the first Sunday of Advent until the Feast of Pentecost, which was last week, we commemorate and celebrate all the mighty acts of God in Jesus Christ for the redemption of the world, his baptism in the Jordan, his fasting and temptation, his praying, his death, resurrection, and ascension, and last week, the sending of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. All those events we just uh, remembered in that extraordinary hymn, St. Patrick's Breastplate. In the second half of the year, the long green season that awaits us in these coming weeks, next week you'll see the altar hangings transform to green, and they'll stay that way for quite a while. In that season, we focus on all the ways that God calls us to grow, hence the green into the fullness of life that God has made possible for us by these mighty acts of creation and redemption in Jesus. It's fitting that we tend to call all of these Sundays in the season that we're about to go into the Sundays after Pentecost, because all along we're invited to remember that it's ultimately by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're enabled to grow into this reality, to, to have this growth happen in our souls. Historically, though, in our Anglican tradition, the Sundays in the second half of the year have been known by another name, the Sundays after Trinity. If you look in an old prayer book, you'll see Sundays after Trinity, marking all the Sundays for the second half of the year. And that's because of what we celebrate today, the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity. We celebrate this preeminent mystery of the Christian faith at this climactic hinge of the church year because we've just spent six months seeing how God the Holy Trinity has revealed himself to us through his works in the world. God the Father sending God the Son for our redemption. God the Son breathing, sending the Holy Spirit for our sanctification. And these two possible names for the long green season ahead of us complement one another insightfully. The growth that the Holy Spirit enables is precisely growth in the grace of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that growth is precisely for the purpose of penetrating ever more deeply into the infinite love of God the Father. The Trinity is the undercurrent, the ground base of the whole Christian life. And today we magnify this mystery in all its wonder. What I want to suggest to you, though, is something that might sound a bit startling at first, if not downright alarming. I want to suggest to you that the dogma of the Holy Trinity, this central mystery of the Christian faith, is simultaneously the most useless and the most practical of all Christian doctrines. Now that may sound very strange if not provocative or even offensive, and also probably a bit confusing. On the one hand, to say that something is useless makes us think that it's good for nothing, that it's without any value. If the Trinity is God, then it surely can't be that. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem exactly to be the most practical of Christian teachings either. Most of us aren't even sure we understand what it means, probably it's probably good that we, don't, or that, that we realize that we don't understand what it means. Much less, though, that it has any daily impact on our lives. And we might even sometimes have a sneaky suspicion that it's one of those things with which people have made God more complicated than he needs to be. So what on earth, then, do I mean by saying that the Trinity is simultaneously useless and practical? Well, let's start with useless. In our modern world, where utilitarian considerations tend to override everything else, we think everything should have a use. You go to college so you can get a job. You study foreign languages so you can increase your business opportunities. You play a sport because it keeps you healthy. 
We worry that unless there's a material benefit to something, and usually we mean a financial benefit to something, then we're wasting our time. Reading poetry is cute, but is majoring in English really going to help you find your way in this competitive world? In the old days, people thought about this differently. The philosopher Aristotle, for instance, thought that things that don't have any use in the sense of any tangible material productivity were actually the best things. You study math, not because it's going to make you a good engineer, though that might happen, but because the proportions and harmonies woven into the fabric of reality are beautiful. You play the violin not to pad your college resume or even as therapy for an otherwise bland life, but rather because a well-played violin just is a wonderful thing in itself. What makes things ultimately good, in this view, is precisely that they are useless. Not valueless, not worthless, in fact, the exact opposite. The things that are most worthwhile are the things that exist for their own sake and not for the sake of what they can get us. We don't use these things, we enjoy them. The supreme and preeminent thing to be enjoyed, if he can even be called a thing, is God the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity serves no use whatsoever, by which I mean that God is not a means to anything other than himself. We don't use God to make ourselves feel good or to get promotions or to look respectable. We come to God, rather, in order to enjoy him. Because he is the only reason, at the end of the day, for doing anything at all. And in fact, all the other things in the world are things we are to use to get to him, even math and music and poetry. We have rightly spent the last six months in the church celebrating all that God has done for us and for our salvation. But today we take a step back and stand in awe simply at who God is. We celebrate today that the world is simply and ultimately about God and not about us. About God for his own sake, his own goodness and truth and beauty, which is just to say for his Godness. But what exactly is that Godness? What is it about God, specifically as Trinity, that makes him so preeminently worthy of our adoration? and our enjoyment. This is where we really get to the heart of our Christian faith, of the great Christian mystery. St. John, the evangelist, in his first epistle, tells us very simply and plainly this straightforward definition of God. He says, God is love. I'm sure many of you have heard that many times. God is love. One of very few kind of definitional statements we get for God in the scriptures. God is love. <coughs> what does that mean? Well, we might think it means that God is loving, right? That God does loving things. And that's absolutely true, of course. I've just talked about how God has shown how loving he is towards creatures and all of his acts of creation and redemption. The Lord is loving to everyone and his compassion is over all his works as the Psalms tell us. But St. John is saying something here even more profound than this. He's not just talking about what God does, acts which show his loving disposition toward us, but rather he's talking about what God is in his very essence. God just is love. Think for a moment about things that you see, circumstances, events, scenes that you see that cause you to say, that right there, that's love. Maybe it's the elderly couple who are sweetly saying goodbye to one another after 60 years of marriage and one of them is lying on their deathbed. You see their final kiss and you say, that is love. <laughs> or maybe it's the mother who stays up all night with her sick child while her child is clinging to her mother for dear life. Maybe it's the friend who steps in front of a bullet to save his comrade from harm. Notice what 
these scenes have in common. It's never just about a singular person, a kind of isolated individual. It's always about a communion of persons, a subject who shows the love and an object who receives it, an object who sends it back, a lover and a beloved, and the love itself that emanates from their communion. It wouldn't really be true that God is love in the fullest, richest, most profound sense, unless there were this bond of communion among distinct persons, even in the very life of God himself. From all eternity, God has been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, eternally pouring his divinity, his infinite life and joy, into the Son. The Son, ceaselessly reflecting back that life and joy, that infinite divinity, back to the Father. And the Holy Spirit being breathed forth as the sigh of delight that rushes up from the eternal and inexpressible embrace shared by God the Father and God the Son. That's who God is. Perfect love, perfect communion in his own eternal life. That's a God that's worthy of our adoration. That's a God who exists for no use beyond himself. That's a God that we can eternally enjoy. Why then would I also say that this doctrine is eminently practical? Why would I say it's the most practical thing we could imagine? Well, another way of thinking about the Trinity, besides as lover, beloved, and the love that binds them together, is to recognize that Scripture regularly speaks about two different aspects of divine action towards the world. Think back to the first book of the Bible, the very first chapter, almost the first verse, the first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what do we hear? We hear that the Spirit brooded over the waters and darkness was on the face of the deep. And then we hear that God spoke, right? God said, let there be light. Later, the psalmist makes this connection a bit more clear, right? He says, by the word of the Lord, by the speaking of the Lord were the heavens made, and by the breath of his mouth all the heavenly hosts. And later, the psalmist says, when referring to the cold hearts that God sometimes encounters in the world, he says that God sends forth his word and melts them, that he blows with his wind, his spirit, and the waters flow. Do you notice the two aspects? There is, on the one hand, God's word, with a capital W, his logic, his reason, that by which he fashions the world according to an orderly paradigm, the world that has these regular and reliable patterns that we count on every day, like the sun coming up and going down. The world has this logic inscribed into it because God has spoken it into his being from his own word, his own logic. But there's also, on the other hand, God's spirit, his breath or his wind, all uh, usually the same word in the scriptures. And this spirit of God names God's loving intention towards the world. God is not just a thinker, you might say, but a feeler, too. He burns with affection for all that he has created. And this is why at the end of those uh, wonderful accounts of the creation, we hear not just that God spoke the world into being, but that God saw that the creation was good. He took delight in it. He loved it by his breath, by his spirit. What we learn in the New Testament, the Christian dispensation, helped along by that reading from the Book of Wisdom, which speaks of wisdom as a kind of personified figure. What we learn, though, in the New Testament in its fullness is that these two different aspects of God in the Old Testament are actually distinct persons in the Godhead. Right? Jesus, who comes forth at his baptism, for instance, and receives the Holy Spirit coming down upon him, and Father speaking from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. These three different persons making up this one unified action of God towards the world. 
but just as important in the New Testament, we learn that this doctrine, this dogma of the Holy Trinity has everything to do with us, has everything to do with you in your daily life, in your practice, in your living. Because God didn't just send his word, his only begotten son, into the world to show you what he's like. He didn't just send his spirit at Pentecost in order to inform you about who he is. He sent his son and his spirit into the world, his word and his breath, in order to draw you back to himself, in order to pull you up into that supreme love, that eternal communion, that perfect blissful delight that God shares among the three persons of the Trinity. That's what you're for, is to be brought up into that life. And that means that there can be nothing more practical than this truth that God is the Trinity. This truth should define and shape and penetrate all of your practice, the life you actually live every day. It starts right here, at this altar, when we gather here for Holy Communion, when you celebrate the Eucharist, we unite ourselves ever more deeply to the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we're stepping inside the word that God has spoken so that we can speak it back to him. And when the priest calls down from heaven the fire of the Holy Spirit, to set this sacrifice ablaze with the inferno of God's breath, we too are consumed in that blaze and made holy with the holiness of divine love. But of course, it doesn't stop here, at this altar. Everywhere you go, when you go forth from this place, you take with you the sound of God's word, the force of God's breath. When the world throws at you its arduous tasks, Circumstances that try your patience, breathe with this breath. Fill your lungs with the spirit that God has already poured inside of you, the love that calms all fears and fortifies you for every trial. When you face problems that your words have failed to solve, problems that your reason can't seem to wrap your mind around, can't seem to comprehend, speak this one word, whether it's out loud or in your heart, this one word that is the name of the one who is himself the source of all words, the source of all rationality, Jesus. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger, Christ in hearts of all that love me. Bind that name to your heart like St. Patrick's breastplate. God has given you a way to breathe, and a word to speak. What could be more practical than that? Of course, if you allow this breath and this word to take hold of your life, you'll find them leading you from the practical through your daily existence back to the eternal. From the means that this world provides for our use back to the one singular end we were made to enjoy you'll find them leading you back to the one thing for which all breathing and all thinking exist, which is to adore the love that moves the sun and the other stars, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to whom be ascribed, as is most justly due, all honor, glory, dominion, and majesty, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen.